Okay, Andy, um, great to speak. Thanks for making time. Um, for people that don't know you, just say a bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Andy Olowski. I'm a health economist and I lead the business intelligence function at Imperial College Health Partners. I'm also a senior population health analytics advisor to NHS England. That's great. I want to I want to start really, really broad, if that's okay. Um, if you could just say, just talk to me a little bit about the value of good analysis in, in health and social care. So just start broad. Well, I think the value of good analysis in, in healthcare is immeasurable. Well, in force, most probably good analytics, you should be able to measure it. But I think it's really, really important on if we're a science-based, we're an evidence-based uh, um, industry, but we should be making um, decisions um, based on the evidence and the data. And so, but without us, without analysts, without uh, um, the, the statisticians, the economists, those people um, helping decision makers make the best possible decision, uh, um, um, how else are they making them? So obviously we, we could talk about data and uh, making sure the data is right, but again, good statisticians, good analysts, um, good guys you know, who understand the data can get round and use appropriate proxy measures but for us, uh, um, I can't see how system leaders are making um, decisions that affect population health uh, of your individual care without using analysts or statisticians or uh, um, people like us, yeah? So it's about uh, informing decision making, it's making sure that as far as we possibly can, decisions taken at the population or the individual level are informed by evidence, informed by data, uh, that kind of thing as well. I just wonder, I mean, you're a health economist. Is there something that economics bring, brings to this as well? Is there a particular slant from that discipline? Um, I think um, as a health economist, I, I think lots of people just think we're about the money and it's not about money, it's about value. And value is measured in many, many different ways. So um, how we um, create models to be able to describe uh, um, um, the population. Remember, it's a social science uh, um, economics. So it's, it's about understanding people why people do what they do and how they do it, and we use, you know, uh, um, you know, our analytics to be able to explain that. I have uh, amazing colleagues uh, um, like uh, Dr. Wayne Smith, who uh, um, again is a PhD in economics, but he really understands the qualitative as well as the quantitative side. We have econometricians, but for us, it's about um, creating models that replicate the world, and then trying to make sure that those models, uh, um, um, you know, help decision making. I think it is. George Box said, you know, all models are wrong, but some can be useful. So as long as we understand what we're trying to do with those modeling. Um, but no, it's not about, um, or I don't want system leaders or people to think that it's just about money. It's about describing value and value is everything from how you value being happy and enjoying your work to um, all the way through to uh, I'm making sure that we're choosing the right intervention for the right population at the right time. Uh, that's great. And I love that quote as well. I think that's, I think that's really good. So, so if that's true of my work. <laughs> <laughs> they're all wrong. They're all wrong. Um, so, so if that's the value of analysis in the round, and if that's if that's what it brings to decision makers, if that's what it gives us in terms of the opportunity to increase the value for the resources that we've got, sort of how well used do you think analysis is at the moment? Do you, to what extent do you think we're realising that value from analysis? Do you think analysis is well used in current decision making? And I'm also very conscious that I'm asking that with, with the backdrop of the pandemic. So maybe you have particular reflections on that, I don't know. But just tell me a bit about your, your thoughts on how well used analysis is now. Yeah. Um, I think that um, there's lots more opportunity to use analytics better. I think that's the politic way of I'll say that it's used very poorly <laughs> by our people. So uh, um, I think that uh, uh, um, we've seen um, time and time again where people's hunches and system leaders who don't really understand uh, um, um, the data or what can be done with the data to help them uh, um, making decisions that uh, um, they feel are evidence-based that may not be. Um, part of the problem is getting the data and, uh, um, and a huge challenge for us still is to get good linked integrated data of the highest possible quality but again there, there are things we can do to help manage that it's, it's people understanding quite how brilliant the local analysts are they're, they're not the guys who want to write dull reports they can do some really really cool stuff that can really help and uh, um and i think that this is upon us 
to kind of fight and argue our case of why we should be around the table helping decision makers. Why are they making decisions without us? And, um, or at least being um, um, uh, informed by the analysts. And I think COVID brought this into sharp relief. I think that people very, very quickly realized that they were trying to make snap, snap judgments, uh, um, but then trying to um, justify those judgments. So how do, you, how do you put the resources in the right place? Where do you get your, your PPE? Where are the ICU beds that are empty? Where do you think they will be full next? And, um, and certainly for our team, there was a lot of work around that. I think it, it also brought uh, um, in sharp relief the data quality issues and how difficult it is to get data. You know, uh, um, you won't believe how many times we sat there when people say, well, what do you mean you can't tell me how many staff are on across Northwest London today? How many beds do we have? And, um, and again, we think, well, no one's ever known this. There's, there's not a data set that we could just pick it from tomorrow. We, we, we can do this but it'll take you know, coordinating with other people, other BI teams, other data sets to be able to bring this stuff in. And you realize that we've been running these multi-billion pound organizations uh, um, without any good data. And, um, and um, you know, I remember my time in hospital when we used to have three lists for how many people were working. HR had one, the divisional directors had one, and, uh, and finance had one to just pick. Just pick which one you wanted to use that day because they would never align or very rarely align. And so these are the kind of um, struggles that, uh, um, that COVID has brought into relief that um, Amos support with every day, trying to argue why we need these things, why people can make better decisions by knowing this. But, uh, but it's also brought into, uh, um, uh, um, into focus data and data quality and how quick that data flows through. Because yes, we can tell you the answers, but not if you know, we have to guess. No, that's excellent. Um, and one thing you touched on in your answer, which I'm really keen to get more thoughts from you about, because I know you're passionate about it and I know that your unit uh, is geared up to make this a reality, as, as is ours. So there's a sort of shared mission here. To tell me a bit about the analyst workforce. Tell me a bit about the system's current use of its analytical resources in terms of the workforce. Is it making best use of what it has? Uh, um... I know you're saying this phrase to twine me up. <laughs> and so, no, I, I think there's huge frustration out there from the analytics workforce. And again, uh, um, when you see uh, um, um, private companies being brought in to, um, to do um, some of the analytics that we know that our guys are capable of uh, um, repeatedly, uh, um, 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 homegrown analysts, I, I think that maybe because system leaders only see the dashboards that they ask for, they only see uh, on some of the basic analytics that are, are being pushed through for operational, you know, operational performance and um, commissioning analytics. And maybe that they don't think, or, or maybe they think that's the only capability we have. But you know, you bump into so many guys who have got, you know, uh, um, you know, masters and PhDs in, in um, you know, every every possible range of analytics and statistics very very few of them came into the nhs just to do you know boring dashboards that no one reads and and people forget that we can see who reads the dashboards now because of click view power bi tableau we know who's looked for how long and what they've clicked on so we so we don't even have to put up with the uh, uh, expletive deleted uh, uh, um, nonsense uh, um, when people say oh it was you know, it was really valuable no one's looked at the dashboard for the last three months why am i doing this and uh, um, um, working with other teams, we saw that they were, were transcribing data from uh, um, one Excel spreadsheet into another, using some VBA to kind of make it a bit quicker, but then having to put it onto PowerPoint um, every day. So because they weren't given the money for Tableau, and you just think, what a complete waste of time uh, um, for these people, uh, um, um, and who were reading this. So no, I, I think that we have an amazingly dedicated uh, um, and talented uh, um, analytic workforce. And I think there's lots of people who would be much more willing to get involved and to be able to do more. Uh, um, there, there wasn't the slightest doubt from uh, my team, and I'm sure it's true of every team across the country who weren't willing to work 24 seven because of COVID. Um, working weekends, working until whenever to get stuff done. Of course it would, it's because they really care. No one joins the NHS for the big pay. 
Google, you know, join Google or the other guys for the big salaries. But uh, um, but you know, you come here because you 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 give a toss and you want to make a difference. And uh, um, and it's people understanding that we have those talents and we have the capability. And uh, um, and one of the things we're doing right now in Northwest London is a kind of skills map of what talents and uh, um, um, we have, not just in our team, but across um, um, Vicky Evans's team, who runs um, the kind of operational and um, commissioning. We've got Kavita's team, who do the wonderful direct care stuff with her amazing WISIC data set. Uh, uh, John Pearson's team, who do performance analytics. What are they actually capable of versus what they're being asked to do? But uh, um, it's on us. You know, it's uh, to, to fight and shout and to make sure that people understand that what we can do and just sitting here and being told to do the stuff and doing it well and um, um, is one thing. But we, we need to push harder and make sure system leaders understand that, that we can do more. How can we help you make better decisions? And, uh, um, and here are the people who can do it. So I think we, now's the time uh, um, to really push for this. That's fantastic. In a second, I'm going to ask you uh, what you would do in order to, to, to remedy some of the problems that we've, we've just discussed. Um, but, but whilst I've still got you on the question of the analytical, analytical workforce, I want to ask you a quite a specific question, really, about the, the analyst as leader. So what you were describing there, you know, we need to make a case, we need to show the value of what we do, we need to get alongside decision makers. Um, that conjures for me this, this sort of picture of the analytical leader, you know, and I, I would count you as one of those anyway. So, so maybe modesty aside, <laughs> what, what are the requirements? What's this role? What's this role, the analyst as leader? What is it? And what are the skills that you need to perform it well? Uh, um, and so I think that the, the problem with being a, a leader of an intelligence team is... Um, you have to be a jack of all trades. You know, it'd be great if you could be a master of all trades, but you're never going to be. And uh, um, when I was at school, they didn't have machine learning and AI was something we used in sci-fi movies to, to blow Dave out of the airlock. It, was, it wasn't, uh, um, uh, um, th these things were, were, were fantasy stuff. Yeah, we didn't have computer labs. Well, we did, but we played Chuck the Egg on a, on a BBC, BBC Acorn. And, uh, um, and so, you know, what you have to do is have, I think, have a broad understanding of what is what people are capable of doing. And uh, part of the reason to, you know, for me to start a PhD in my mid to late forties is to to actually get back and start using R to to start doing some analytics to to be able to um, walk the talk that uh, um, I'm going through. But I think you have to have a broad range of knowledge of knowing what uh, um, what people are capable of doing. What's the difference between an econometrician and an economist? What's the difference between one of our analysts and a statistician? Um, the SQL guys, what do they do? They're, they're, they're data extractors who understand the coding and the fact that these are somewhat distinct disciplines. I think people struggle to understand that the intelligence work, there's very rarely one person capable of doing the whole breadth of the work that we do. And we have, you say, people who extract data and, um, and maybe create these wonderful clean flat files and work with the guys. Analysts, and, analysts who um, do some, um, you know, wonderful uh, uh, mathematics and, uh, uh, and statistics behind it, economists who turn it into model, data visualizers who may have uh, um, expertise in um, behavioral science so people better engage with the dashboards um, and can create a narrative because what we need to do is create this uh, um, from all this complexity and this um, very you know detailed work a simple message that um, system leaders and other people can can you know uh, um, understand and you know make decisions from and i think it's that part of um understanding that whole breadth of what we need to do and we, we need to be salespeople. and it's you know we you need to be able to share and, um, and make sure people understand what your team can do and then how can they engage with it why aren't you using my team why would you um ask for um you know those third party people to come in when when we can do it and um and how can we um um you know or what do you need from me to be able to help you understand what we can do and it's that salesman's job and i think that when you get to this level one you know my my you know um r is terrible as my team will tell you <laughs> and uh um, and they will 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 we'll laugh at the, um, some of the methods but what we need to be able to do is understand what can be done and then make sure that it's our job to get round and be as sharp elbowed as possible, as, as pushy as is appropriate, 
to, so we don't get fired, but uh, um, to make sure that the, the guys know what we can do. And because um, if we're not doing it, then no one's going to do it for us. Yeah, no one is there. I, I have not yet met the, the chief exec uh, um, who was an economist or an analyst who came through that route. Yeah, I, I, um, and so until we all have a place, you know, we have, um, you know, CCIOs or CIOs on, on the board who are analysts and not about the data infrastructure and servers. And again, super important stuff. Yeah, and I, 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 I'm not playing that down at all. But to have analysts who uh, who can you know rep be representative on the board, or at least have um, the ear of the people on the board, always going to be that afterthought. Oh, they'll, they'll do it. They'll do the maths. Undervalued and uh, um, or potentially undervalued, and uh, um, and not driving the change that we should we you know should be making and want to make. Excellent. So so a role there for the analysts as leaders to to, to fulfil that gap and, and to make that case. Okay. So in in the in the in the conversation that we've had you've painted this picture for me of this incredibly valuable thing that we're calling analysis and all the things that it can do um, and yet for a whole series of reasons that we've discussed not not able to fulfill that potential not able to realize all the value from it and not able to make best use of the, the workforce and the resources that that we as a system have so what's to be done you know what, what would you do where would you start um. Uh, and I suppose, you know, we're in systems uh, uh, um, consumed by um, trying to better manage the slim resources we have. And there are so many conflicting priorities uh, um, um, for system leaders, you know, uh, um, a bit, you know at acute level, uh, um, commissioning and um, be it PCN borough or um, old CCG level. Um, and to ICS. So how do we help them uh, um, understand and manage those priorities of which we are one? And so, and I think it's, uh, and again, maybe COVID has given people the opportunity to see quite how, um, you know, quite how valuable the teams are in helping them make good uh, um, evidence-based decisions, uh, um, which can be done in, a, in quick time. I'm not sure if they think that some of the work takes, you know, you know weeks and months and wouldn't be done, but, um, but now's the time as I say, is how can we work with those system leaders to say, uh, uh, um, look, there's, you, you have uh, uh, a valuable resource locally that can help you be uh, um, the best system leader and um, control and manage one of the best systems uh, um, around, but you have to have that inward investment. And that inward investment doesn't take as long as they think. It's uh, um, for the costs of some of the um, work that we've seen that have come from um, the um, you know the consultancies and those private companies you can do um, wonderful stuff and run teams for um, um, you know a, a significant amount of time you know years on some of the works for one piece of work and you get those people invested so I think now's the time to try and highlight uh, um, to the to the system leaders the cost of developing these teams the fact that it's not going to be you know some of our greatest success has been sharing between teams. And what we've found out is that there's been no proprietorial kind of uh, um, uh, um, kind of marking of the territory. There's been no, this is my homework, not yours. I'm not going to share it. Yeah, um, um, as we've seen from the Kahoot site that um, um, Suki and Jason Pickles has run, thousands of us sharing our code, wanting to share our code, you know, working with you know, units like yours, uh, um, the, um, so that's the strategy unit. So working with the Nuffield Trust, the King's Fund, uh, and the Health Foundation, everyone willing to share how we work closely with the guys in public health, in the county councils, um, in hospitals and across. And you don't have to build up a huge expensive team. What you need to be able to do though is, um, is get the system to understand, to enable these kind of hub and spoke approaches. So how can we flex into the expertise over here to nick something, some, some resource, and it may be a day, two, two days, a month, it may be a short period of time, concentrated time, and how we kind of pull that back and we learn it. And I think that we're, we're such an open group that uh, um, I say analysts in general, uh, um, who aren't sitting there thinking, this is my code, I can make a fortune from it. That uh, um, this is what we need to uh, um, um, tell system leaders, look, we are a, a, a powerful, you know, uh, I'd say a, a, a powerful resource that can make a big difference for the system, a big difference for you in making decisions. It's not going to cost you a huge, you know, chunk of money. 
But what you need to do, be able to do is enable this cross work, especially in an ICS, and get people to feel this sense of, uh, of ownership and, uh, and being part of a you know, wider, broader team is really, really important. But again, it comes back to sales. Yeah? Someone, that, who's the analyst leader who's going to go out and knock on all these doors and, uh, um, and share you know, their passion for this? And, you know, and how do we get all the analytic leaders working together to all knock on the door at the same time to show that we are working together? And, uh, um, and then come up with a proposal. You know, if, if anyone can come up with the numbers to prove that we're valuable to work, work with, it's us, yeah? And so surely we can write a business case that's evidence-based, you know, better than anyone. So, uh, um, so you know, it's, that's how we, I think we need to push back. That's excellent. It's certainly been our experience as well in the Midlands that the, um, the pandemic has led to a sort of outbreak of networking amongst analysts and networking and sharing and distribution of code and of data and, and all the rest of it. And, and, you know, sort of one of our main reflections is there's a lot of, there's a lot of what's going on at the moment that is valuable that we will want to retain in terms of ways of working. And also, uh, you know, one of the crying shames that we weren't better networked before, that as an analytical community, we'd not put that effort in and we weren't better networked. And so therefore we weren't, we were improvising on the way through. Yeah. And I think, that, you know, there's some great stuff that's come from it. But what we would want to retain, I think, is that sense of network, of community, of sharing, of commons, of, of that kind of thing. Andy, that's been great. I've, I've really enjoyed interviewing you. Is there anything else that you want to add? Is there anything I've not asked you about? Um, no, uh, I think maybe just to pick up on your last point is, is how do you make sure this network doesn't die? How do you make sure that this event today uh, um, that people have uh, listened to and joined and um, at this time, I think there's nearly 100 people signed up, there may be even more. Uh, um, but how do we keep this going? And so how do we keep working with the strategy unit to um, build this community? Because as you say, the, the, one, uh, um, the one bit that uh, um, was always amazing uh, um, throughout um, all of the COVID stuff, and it's still today, is the willingness to share and, and, and to be completely open about some of the, the, the problems that we're having. Is everyone else, you know, everyone else having to use a sit rep? Who's got access to the national sit rep? I remember week one, how the hell did you get hold of this? You know, we, we were literally writing it off of the screen and all of the data errors that would have come from this, that uh, I'm trying to do this. And I think that the network shared solutions for this and, uh, um, and you know, and now for the much more complex stuff that we're going through. So I think that it's on, upon all of us uh, um, to keep this network alive. And um, I think we've, we've shown our value yet again and it's uh, our chance to use events like this and to uh, um, and it's upon us to keep it going. So if we're not doing this, it, we are the community. If we don't do this, no one's going to do it for us. Yeah. And so, um, we, you know, lots of us may be nerds. And um, as you say, I, I took down my Star Wars, um, um, Lego Star Wars Death Star. Uh, um, um, but, <clears throat> but, you know, but if it's not us, no one's going to do it for us. And so this is our network we've got to keep it alive and a huge thanks to uh, you Fraser and, and the strategy unit for um, and creating events like this. You know, we've got to be here, we've got to share because if we don't, no one will do it for us. Oh, that's brilliant, that's a fantastic place to end as well. Listen Andy, thank you ever so much for your time, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much Fraser.